So what would you give this signal? This is like a 585. Easy to copy. So with any of these transmitters, there's a big temptation to try to bring the simple circuit up to the standards of today's transmitters. Um, certainly when you hear some of these signals, they don't sound normal on the band. Uh, a new official observer who's not familiar with uh, these types of contests where people are using the uh, primitive equipment might uh, contact the ham and say, my God, what are you doing? Uh, you must have a broken transmitter. Uh, you're making uh, noises on the band, uh, and uh, it, it's going to be uh, a pink slip for sure from the FCC if you don't correct your transmitter. But uh, really, uh, these antique transmitters are on the air for such a short period of time and on frequencies that are not as, uh, as much used uh, at the time of the contest and uh, we get uh, very few complaints. It's similar to complaining about someone that's tuning their Harley that perhaps they need to uh, uh, add a better muffler system or something like that. It just It's kind of the wrong question. Uh, these primitive transmitters, of course, do drive you nuts and a lot of uh, work is put into them to correct the problems like uh, uh, if the thing is, is the high plains drifter and is drifting up the band, you want to figure out what that thermal drift is all about and how to correct it. Uh, you can work on chirp, but uh, a regulated power supply is going to clean a lot of stuff up, but is it really appropriate to use on a transmitter like this? And there are some people that, similar to the Harley allegory, dirty up their transmitter just for the contest possibly for maybe an hour of operation, just so you can hear some authentic sounds. So, uh, hope this doesn't scare you off. Um, this is state-of-the-art 1920s. It's not state-of-the-art 21st century. First, uh, we notice that the transmitter is actually a mix of very old and very new parts. Um, again, it's not the parts themselves that are important, but it's the pedigree of the circuit that's important during this contest. So, for instance, this terminal strip might be something from the 1960s. These automotive bulbs that are used to balance the filament, you know, might be something you can get at the auto store. Um, the tube base might be a World War II surplus tube base. Some of these 1920s tubes were used in World War II, so they had to have sockets for them. Uh, this variable capacitor, it could be actually something from the 1920s. And of course the meters were available then. This vernier dial might be 30s. Uh, the wire, of course, is something that you would scavenge uh, or get at the hardware store. Here's a homemade radio frequency choke. This is a choke coupled output so that the tank is actually cold to DC. That's really good when you're running about 500 volts here. You don't want your hand to go on there and get a shock. And we're actually isolated with this choke and a capacitor that goes over uh, to the tank. So it's, it's got some, some safety features built into it. But even so, I wouldn't be putting my hands around this transmitter while it's in operation. Now, if you received a signal report of 597, would you be offended that maybe your transmitter was being picked on? Well, a lot of these transmitters, especially in the early days, were run on raw AC. That means instead of a high voltage supply, they simply uh, took a transformer stepped up the line voltage, the 117 volts AC, to maybe 500 volts AC, and applied it to the circuit. Now, 
you're running a transmitter on AC? Well, the tube only conducts in one direction, so it self-rectifies. That's right, the tube oscillator actually self-rectifies the AC. And you still get the power out, you still get a signal. However, there's also a choppy uh, modulation of around, uh, in our case it's going to be 60 hertz, that rides on the signal. So the signal has a musical note of 60 hertz mixed in with the CW, and it makes a buzzing noise on the air and also would drive people crazy. So it's not suggested that we operate the 1929 transmitters like Grandpa did, or really Great Grandpa, but we use pure DC. Um, and uh, pure DC being uh, rectified and filtered DC on the plates of the tubes rather than raw AC. Um, they used to have uh, they used to have a, a saying for pure DC, pigs devouring corn, P pure DC. So here is the raw AC setup. Uh, by raw AC, I mean as a power supply, we're using 60 cycle AC power as the plate power supply. Now normally we would put about 500 volts on this tube, and with 500 volts we would expect to get out eight or nine watts uh, here on 160 meters. But in this case I'm using an AC transformer and I have my meter set for AC. Let's see what we're developing here. 188 volts. To show principle that's probably fine. Let's bring it up just a little bit. There's 250 volts. 250 volts of AC are now from plate to cathode on the tube and when we key the tube the tube is going to say ah on the positive cycle current can flow and I can have an oscillation but on the negative cycle of the AC the tube is cut off so in effect the tube is going to be sending pulsating RF pulses of RF out instead of pure RF coming out now, of course, with something like this, I am running a dummy load. I'm not going to run this into the antenna. This is not something you'd want to put on the air, but this is certainly how our great-grandpa operated if he did not have a proper rectifier or filter system for his high-voltage DC. Uh, the transformer that I'm using, I've taken some safety precautions. I'm running it off a Variac that is fused. And I put some Kapton tape on the high voltage terminals. Other than that, we're using the standard brown lamp cord that you're all familiar with. So let's key this up and see what raw AC sounds like on the air. Now let's see, uh, let's, now I'm listening in uh, lower sideband so we can hear what's going on a little better. Let's see what it sounds like on the uh, sidebands. Not very clean. But let me tell you, that was a way that people got on the air in the old days when they did not have the proper power supply. Now, uh, the other thing that can happen with a transmitter as you key it, especially an oscillator, you can get some chirp, some whooping noise from the oscillator coming on frequency. 
also have drift so that the uh, the note actually moves up the band or down the band depending on the uh, the way that things are heating up on the breadboard Ooh. so listen for all of these really interesting things that can uh, come out of the these simple transmitters there is a benefit the benefit is you can certainly identify a transmitter that sounds different on the air and even a 2 watt transmitter with some of these uh, defects uh, becomes easier to copy than a pure note 599 type signal So if we look at some of the construction uh, techniques on this transmitter, you'll notice we have a coil that's made of, it looks like number 10 wire. Now a number 10 coil like this is going to be sagging in the middle, and any vibration or sagging will of course cause the transmitter to wobulate or uh, make some pretty, uh, pretty nasty uh, noises. And uh, in the old days, what the guys would do is they would support the coil on a pair of glass towel rack rods, something like that. I've just taken a couple pieces of angle plastic, and the coil is just suspended and resting nicely in that. And I put a little bit of uh, goop here on the ends to keep the coil in place. And that's adequate to keep the coil from vibrating and causing... Uh, you know, frequency shift, modulation, and uh, that said, you still would like to operate the transmitter on some good rubber feet, or better yet, something that dampens the uh, vibrations even more as you key or move things around the bench. Uh, sturdiness, very important. Heavy wire, very important for these radios to keep them stable. I mean, we're using 1920 circuits, and we're expecting to use them on the air with people that have very narrow filters in their receivers. And if you're not right on frequency, they will not answer you. Fortunately, with the Bruce Kelly 1929 contest, people actually look for your signal. And if you call, they will answer. They will answer almost every time. And they can hear almost anything because they're listening very carefully for these very weak signals coming from these primitive transmitters. Uh, also, uh, uh, milliameter is very important on a transmitter like this because you need to know what your input power is. Uh, there's no such thing as dipping the meter because it's an oscillator. However, you will find that the, uh, the milliamps changes as the tap position changes and as the coupling coil changes. This one has been optimized to give good coupling uh, for 50 ohm line on 160 meters. Uh, normally you would have a variable capacitor associated with that to ground to uh, maximize the output into the load. But uh, close enough, it's working, it's getting a few watts into the line, and that's all we can ask for a transmitter like this. Notice I have a vernier dial on the tuning capacitor. Uh, that's uh, that's a really good idea because uh, we've got a lot of plates here to hit the low frequency. This is a high C, low L type Hartley. The more capacitance you have, the better. The more stability that you're able to get with these transmitters. So the high C, low L style Hartley uh, seems to work the best on uh, on the bands uh, for stability. There's a conventional grid leak over here going into the grid of the tube, and I discussed the filament set up with the uh, center tap that's uh, artificially made by a pair of resistors in the form of two automotive lamps. Other than that, we have a homemade radio frequency choke, which you can't see right now. It's in back of the valve, but uh, let me move the camera so you can see that. So this choke is a, a multi-section choke. It's just random wire wrapped around this big dowel. And uh, I measured it to make sure it had enough impedance to work in the uh, plate circuit of the tube. And look at this giant parasitic suppressor. It's a big 5 watt, looks like a 39 ohm resistor with a few turns of 
number 12 enameled wire. And we have some various bypass capacitors associated with the filament. But that's about it. There's not much to this transmitter. It's pretty simple. It's a simple Hartley oscillator. This is the first year I've had 160. So this is a quickie antenna I put up for 160. Basically uh, five 135 foot pieces of wire and elevated ground plane. This thing was absolutely stellar on 160 and it worked very well on 40 as a receive, a quiet receive antenna. So this is 160 meters tonight on the uh, Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO party. In this contest uh, you have to use circuits and tube types that were designed and in use before 1929. You can use modern parts but uh, the tube type at least has to be before 1929 and you have to use a circuit from before 1929. So a lot of guys get started with whatever parts they can find on hand and then slowly collect the period type parts and the transmitters start to look more and more like the real thing after a few years. This is a station from Connecticut is talking to a station from Maine on the contest. The station in Connecticut I think is using a Hartley oscillator like this one that you see in front of you. The station in Maine I believe is using a, a push-pull transmitter a push-pull of some kind. A little bit of musicality to the note. You know, we have a, a system called RST, Readability, Strength, and Tone, and normally you hear 599. It's virtually a perfect signal. But with these old 1929 type transmitters, we get to go into those numbers a little bit and you get some very interesting reports. You know, reports like 595 or 583, that kind of thing. So in the interest of uh, keeping everybody calm about spurs and harmonics, the uh, Amateur Radio Relay League is interested in the cleanliness of your signal. Um, I wanted to measure the, uh, the harmonics on, on the transmitter. And to do this, um, I'm using my reference receiver, which has a calibrated and DBM meter, along with my uh, loop antenna and a dipole. These are both fairly close coupled and uh, should be able to pick up the harmonics quite easily. So. Uh, Let's take a look at the harmonic chart. So I'm going to do the test on uh, 1815 kilohertz, and a second harmonic would be 3630, 5445, the third, and so on. I've taken measurements uh, using the loop antenna and the dipole. The dipole uh, had a lot more pickup, of course, so I had to put a 10 dB pad in line with it in order to kind of line up the measurements. But as you can see, I'm getting at least 50 dB to the second harmonic um, through the air. So this thing is, uh, is doing quite well. And uh, I'll show you. I've got it hooked up to the loop right now. And uh, basically I have the 10 dB pad on the loop. So let's look at the, uh, the fundamental first. So it says minus 20. And now let's look at that second harmonic at 3630, which is in the 80 meter band. About minus 80. So that's 60 dBC. That's pretty good. Uh, I added a 10 dB pad to the loop antenna's output. So I can say with pretty good confidence that the transmitter's got between 50 and 60 dB of uh, 
attenuation to the second harmonic and uh, even more to the third. Now how am I getting that kind of performance? How am I getting that kind of performance out of this transmitter? First of all, the transmitter has a very high Q tank. It has a link coupled output and most importantly it has a well-tuned antenna that's exactly resonant on the fundamental frequency. All of those things add together to give you rejection of harmonics and spurs. So is this transmitter cleaner than many QRP rigs on the air? Wink wink. Maybe it is. It's a hundred year old technology but it's a pretty clean transmitter. So let's see if we can call. A little bit tough to bring them out, but uh, I worked that station, KB0HXL. Here on 160 meters, you want to call CQ. And you have to be careful around the breadboard because uh, vibrations are picked up very easily. So that's it. Uh, basically you send CQ, you listen to hear if someone comes back. Um, I have an amplified loop so you, turn, you can turn the loop off for less sensitivity. But usually at QRP powers you're not going to overload anything. The loop is separated from the transmit antenna. So I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video on the Bruce Kelly 1929 QSO party. And maybe this uh, has piqued your interest in building your own breadboard transmitter with a one-tube self-excited oscillator and getting on uh, 80 meters or maybe even 160. So I ended up with about 25 contacts over three bands that I operated. I did not operate on 20, but I operated on 80, 40, and 160. And... Uh, I can tell you I didn't do too well on 160. I only made four contacts on 160, but I didn't give it very much time this year. I only participated one weekend.